Hey everybody, P. Dave Turner, executive producer and host of the Break It Down Show, bringing to you today Glenn Banton. And Glenn, is, you're going to be, well, you're going to be amazed by Glenn. He's done a lot of different things. He's designed military weapons. He's been a mentor to NBA players, and he also works with Operation Supply Drop. Now, what does he do there? He helps veterans thrive through transition, and we're going to talk a lot about the nonprofit space, the charity space, because it's the time of year where we're making resolutions, we're spending that last bit of charitable money that we have in our pockets, and I want you guys to understand what it is to run one of these organizations, the kind of challenges to overcome, and the amount of help that they really need, and the passion that goes into charitable work, especially because we have such a strong veteran charter here getting that kind of work to those kind of people who need it most. There's literally a guy I know, the veteran, who has his car. It's out of registration, and it's a simple $1,200 problem that if we could get the resource, the veteran, to accept the help, we can fix that one problem with the signing of one check. It's so easy to do, but it takes effort to make all of those things come together and become reality. Okay, enough preaching from me. I know you guys are going to love Glenn. He's just a big ball of ideas, and I just love the heck out of what he's doing and what he's already done. I know you will too. Hey, listen, support the show. The show is growing like crazy because you guys are already doing this. So buy the shirts, share the show, tell your friend. Hey, tell me who you want to hear on. Say, hey, Pete, I know someone. Produce an episode with me. I'm a serious. Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Hey, my great-grandma's so-and-so's whatever. We'll figure it out. Anybody who knows World War II veterans, I want to know their story. Anybody from the big band era, I want to know their story. My job is to say yes to the stories that you guys want to hear. Help me find those stories. Hit me up again at P. Day Turner on all social media. I'm looking forward to hearing from Glenn. You guys, one more thing. This is important because it's part of this show. SaveTheBrave.org. We'll talk about it plenty in the episode. SaveTheBrave.org. Help us help make a difference. If not that... Save the brave.org is still help. Hey, listen, I love all you guys. I appreciate it. You're coming up in the holidays here between Hanukkah and Kwanzaa and Christmas and New Year's and Festivus and all these things. It's time to slow down, relax, and enjoy. I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. Here comes Glenn. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Glenn Banton with OSD, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Glenn and I were talking uh, off mic before the show about some of his charitable work, and he does a lot of things. He's advising at VetNet and, and do and he works quite a bit in the veteran space. So uh, a chance to meet someone outside of the norm, you know, we try to bring a lot of different people on because well, there's a lot of different points of views, a lot of different perspectives. There's a lot of different people doing things. And Glenn, in particular, I wanted to talk to you about the charity stuff because we're getting down to the end of the year. Where those of us that give charitably, you know, we have budgets to spend and we're trying to get this money out the door. So I will do my shameless plug <laughs> right now and say anybody that's got a budget that's going to put money towards charity, I want you to consider Save the Brave. You can either do it monthly like I do, a small amount of money, or, um, you know, end of the year, one big lump sum, and then do a small amount of money on top of that and join me. And, and I'm talking, here's what I'm talking about. Would you buy a veteran lunch? Would that be something you do? And even if veterans aren't your home charity space, would you buy, buy a veteran lunch? If you would, just kick $25 in a month to save the brave. I'm telling you, this is I work with these people. This is my charity. We are not sponging. This is all going into trying to keep veterans alive, dealing with PTSD, reducing veteran suicide. We're going to be doing a lot of work towards that. So there, there's my pitch. I get to go first, Glenn, because it's my show. But briefly give us your pitch, and then let's talk about as you run a charity, what kind mm-hmm. of things that you have to encounter. And then we'll get into a, a hundred other things because you're a fascinating dude. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. That's, that's a nice thing for you to say. No, I mean, my simple pitch is, is, is really the same as yours. And my broad personal appeal is find something you love and financially support it. I mean, period. That's, that's what it comes down to. And I'm, I'm happy to, in many cases, and I'm proud to have helped a lot of corporations figure out what the heck that looks like and 
some didn't have OSD as, as the answer to that. And to be on, again, from a, a, a person to person point of view, I don't care. I just want people to be passionate about helping other people. Uh, obviously the, you know, the OSD pitch and this is kind of what you and I were talking about before the show is, you know, it is cash is king, whatever organization are supporting. I mean, in kind donations are absolutely fantastic. You know, we use a lot of them from, you know, big partners like black rifle coffee and Starbucks and Microsoft and, you know, all these, you know, all these different companies that are donating these products, but we still have to do something with them. And so when we suddenly have, you know, within say our supply drop program, um, I don't know, 20 pallets of board games that need to go overseas to USOs and deployed troops, well, we got to get them there. We have to house them. We have to have, you know, staff and people that maintain relationships with these companies and make sure that they understood, you know, understand that we're, we're grateful for their support and, and figuring out other creative ways. And that comes down again, it's, it is that, you know, donate, 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 find ways to work that into your budget. Um, you know, whether you lean towards, you know, different sorts of views on tithing, if you go above and beyond that, it's just figure out how to work that in and work with organizations that have a set of values that align with yours. And again, stay involved, keep a pulse on it. Don't forget why you're supporting them and find ways that you can bring others. So you know, for us, it's, you know, go to weosd.org. We have some really interesting, I'd say, campaigns that we run this time of year that uh, dive straight into this. But we'd be uh, forever grateful and appreciative of uh, folks taking a look and pushing that donate button. Yeah, the donate button. And again, obviously money helps. It's a big thing. But what I also want to say is your attention, your time, mm -hmm. your effort. These are all other things that you can do. We always need money because you got to keep the lights on. You got to, you know, it takes money to plan some of these things. Yeah, and maybe there's a misconception, but if you hire a, a high end MC to take your event, like really, and make it pop and like get more people to donate money, that person needs to get paid. They're not, mm -hmm. they might give you a discounted rate, but th that's still their job. Like you're hiring them yeah. to do their job for you. So is that like, I think a perception, a misconception, uh, Glenn, is that, you know, when you have, oh, I don't know, Ryan Weaver, the country star, you know, former veteran, mm -hmm. when you say, hey, come out, he's like, you know what? You don't got to pay me, but you do got to pay my band. You know, you yep. do got to fly us there. You do have to feed us and put us in a hotel. All of that stuff is normal and should be expected by any business. And that's really what a nonprofit is. It's just a different kind of business. So when we're saying, hey, we could use a couple of dollars, that stuff makes a difference. It might be that we get to hire a higher level. So here's the thing Scott Husing and I were talking about this last night. And Jay Moore is, is officially now associated with Save the Brave. It's his home charity. Okay. That's so awesome. we get to go to Jay because we can put enough, you can invest money into his, and his job, yes, of course he's funny. His job is famous because mm -hmm. when he puts things out, 200,000 people hear it. You don't get there by just having nothing. You have to have a budget. You have to have money so that you can put things together, go out and and show people that you're actually doing the thing that you're doing. And if you get famous attached to your brand, that's one of the big things. Everybody can work hard on something, but everybody needs a different job. And in that case, Jay Famous is part of it. So that's that's sort of that money goes to these things. This is building this machine and you're constantly, to get more help, you have to improve the machine all the time. And that always costs money. Yeah, no, and, and our, in our case too, because you know, OSD's formed into a veteran support ecosystem, if you will. So we we stretch from you know active duty, you know, basically at enlistment, all the way through transitioning out and into you know the the future part of a veteran's life, you know, and and addressing the needs of spouses and family. Mm. And so what we end up with is this really big challenge where if there's a major step forward or extra attention on one of the pillars or one of the phases or one of the programs, suddenly the overall demand for everything goes up. Right. And I mean, we've seen this happen over and over where, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we have this online program called Games to Grunts. And it wouldn't surprise me if a number of folks listen to this are actually aware of it. It got picked up by probably about three dozen media outlets and was included in the VA's national newsletter. Mm -hmm. So that on the surface is awesome, right? Mm -hmm. Lots of coverage. The challenge was nobody reached out to us. No big deal. You know, some might call that lazy journalism at scale, but you know, it is what it is. And you know, we use that as an opportunity to then create relationships with some of these outlets. But it ended up causing in the course of 96 hours, uh, we had a quarter million visitors to this program. 
it distributed over 50,000 video games valued at over $1.2 million to more than 20,000 verified veterans and, and active service members through our partnership with ID.me. And again, all those numbers, that's incredible. What ended up happening is that it got rid of a lot of our inventory on that particular program, which now we have to, due to the attention on that program, we now need to hire more partner development people that can maintain tighter relationships. Again, that program happens to be around video games. So that would be with, you know, developers and publishers in the industry and making sure they understand, you know, the value of what's going on and the fact that, again, suddenly we could get a quarter million people looking at this particular program and the value of it. And then additionally, from a historic perspective, approximately 50% of people that find OSD through that program end up using our other programs and services. So, you know, they're, they're backdoor, side door, if you will. So suddenly we might see massive increases in the need for professional development or, you know, setting up larger scale, substantive, you know, community service projects. Again, all these things are absolutely amazing and incredible, but it comes back to understanding that, yes, we, you know, we're still a business. We just have a different tax code that arguably, you know, we have to be more transparent about. And, you know, and somebody has to, to pay for it. But I, I will say, you know, you, interest, you mentioned the uh, example with uh, Jay. We had a similar one last year with the commercial we did with Travis Pastrana and Nitro Circus, which is mm. actually probably one of the coolest days I've ever been a part of. It was, you know, me, another guy on our, our team, the property owner, Travis, and two of his guys, the camera guy. Basically, we hung out for about eight to 10 hours while Travis kept jumping out of airplanes and <laughs> we're, we're filming this commercial. Right. The commercial was to highlight OSD. Xbox was behind it. And the reason why Xbox came to us, and I know we've kind of leaned towards the gaming stuff to start, but the reason why Xbox loves working with OSD is we have this place for gaming that's predominantly around active duty, you know, kids, you know, those sorts of things where it has its importance, but we don't make it so important that it takes the place of you know, other types of relationship, balancing activities, you know, getting together in person. But what was rad is the finances behind that was Travis said, yeah, we'll do this. But Xbox, I want you, instead of paying me to just shuffle that money over for a discounted rate to my Team Puerto Rico motocross team. So he has a he has his charity, which is Team Puerto Rico. They go, you know, as a motocross team, constantly helping with the rebuild down there. They go build, you know, houses and schools, and then they do a little motocross thing together. Really rad. And then Xbox ended up giving us a, a very substantial amount of, of funding. Hey, this is P. Dave Turner from the Break It Down Show, checking in real quick to ask you this. John, Scott, and I all support Save the Brave with our time, our location, our effort, and our money. Each month, we give a small amount. Do the same with us. Go to savethebrave.org. Click on the donate tab, pick an amount that you want to come out each month, and they will handle all the rest. I stand behind these folks. Thank you so much. Let's get back to the show. And then Xbox ended up giving us a, a very substantial amount of, of funding. So the, it was cool. So we ended up with this great media opportunity. Travis is taken care of because his organization is taken care of. And then we ended up getting paid for showing up because we fulfilled a piece of a story that Microsoft and Xbox wanted to be able to tell. Right. So all that being said, I think it still comes down to kind of that responsibility from a, a leadership and understanding as a business. And this, you know, this goes above and beyond nonprofit. This is any business. You need to understand how what you do fits into the larger story for, you know, the people that are paying for what you do or the people that are enjoying the product or service that you put out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's well said. And, and also when you have these opportunities, you know, they are worth a lot to an organization. You have to work the shit out of them. Like you have to like, you know, this isn't like, hey, that was great and fun. Like here's our opportunity. What products, what deliverables are we going to get out from doing this thing? You know, and it's, that's okay. when the work begins. And I guess just again, because the whole nonprofit space, it's really that we have a shitty perception of it. Like we, you want a great CEO. And if that person works for a fraction of the cost, great. But like these people are great at business. And so- they cost money, <laughs> you know, like some organizations, they keep it really lean, but even like the big ones that have big expensive CEOs, there's very few people on the earth that can handle the job 
of growing oh, yeah. a massive organization that takes an you know an MBA from a high end school uh, or or you've worked the equivalent of equivalent of that and those people are valuable you have to value them yeah you get a good deal out of them but come on you know like <laughs> yeah yeah well that's what I've always said you know people like to pick on or you see these these yeah it happens every you know two years where suddenly the masses start wailing and gnashing teeth about nonprofits and failing to understand that, again, you want the services to run smoothly and efficiently. And most nonprofits that are very proud and really throw around the, hey, 100% of our money goes to our programs or, you know, it's 100% volunteer. That's fine. The reality is if that's your model and your mentality, you will never grow to reach the potential. It is actually impossible because even though you have the full attention of everybody that's a volunteer, until you have people where it's their number one attention, you can't take it to the next level because it will always fall behind something else. It's right. just, and it's not, it's not so much that you have to pay somebody for their attention because it's, it's genuinely not about the money at that point. It's about, that's how life works. You know, people have families, they have roofs, you know, they put over heads, they have food to eat. And I've always found it, it's a very myopic view to realize that if there's an individual, say, running, I don't know, a half a billion dollar nonprofit that the CEO is making even $10 million, like there's nothing wrong with that. Because if that particular individual, because it's their business and executive and leadership skills that allow that organization to be where it is, Amen. that person switches over to for profit. They're going to be making five times that amount easily. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's it's just understanding that particular dynamic. And I think the more, you know, in the same way where I, with a lot of just the for-profit businesses I'll consult with, you know, I'll meet a really smart engineer or a smart product designer, and they cannot grow unless they can find somebody that has the business acumen to understand scale yeah. and supply chain. It's the same thing in nonprofits. You have to find people that understand scale and supply chain where the supply chain is co-branding, co-marketing, and fundraising opportunities. You know, what's funny is this whole conversation that we just had, you know, it can feel preachy, but I just want to point something out. You didn't talk in any way significantly about the actual charitable work, but this is all like, this is how the machine actually works. Like the output of wrapping your arms around somebody, handing them a check, opening the door to their house that's adaptive to their, you know, discipline, whatever that help is. You didn't discuss oh, yeah. any of that. This is all mm -hmm. the stuff that makes that stuff work better so that that outcome is not like, here's a $20 check, you know, like, no, this is a game changing check. This is $15,000 to help you with problem X or, you know, we're going to work on curing this disease and you want to hand a check over that scientist that needs that check. He'll take a $20 oh, yeah. check, <laughs> but what she really needs is a $20 million check. It's just like, you know, yeah. if I could hire 10 more of me, then we could get there fast. So all of these things, all of that, that output, that check, that, that door opening moment, it's all dependent on the things that you're talking about. And that as a leader of a charity, you've got to find these business, you know, these uh, partnerships you need. I need a corporation that will back us and give us incredible opportunities so we can market. I need more famous. So I've got Travis Pastrana. What? What's next? How do I take these Travis videos and turn them into something? And it's like, bam, 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 bam. And all of those things lead to those happy moments where you go, we just did. And you said earlier off mic, we just did something because we're humans. We want to help. Mm -hmm. And here is all of that. We did all of this work to create this one little bit of help right here for you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that's where our, I mean, on the OSD side, I mean, we just surpassed our 1 million serve milestone, which is essentially it's a roll up of all the, you know, all the troops, all the veterans and all the dependents we've supported for, you know, over the past almost nine years through our org. And, you know, our next thing is, OK, that's great. That was yesterday. What do we do next? And, you know, we made a commitment to hitting our next million by the end of 2021. And anybody that knows me knows that's an extremely conservative target based upon what we already know is coming down the line. Right. But that's the thing is it, it, it needs to be sustainable because, you know, like you said, you know, it's one thing to be able to give somebody, you know, give an individual that that one time support. But and, and sometimes the, the continuation, the sustained side is not necessarily monetary. It might be the community, the connections that that infrastructure itself might cost a couple bucks. But 
really you want to figure out how to truly wrap your arms around somebody and be there as long as you need to be there. And so we've seen this with like, you know, a lot of programs that we've considered launching or some that we ended up launching and they, we just waited a little bit before they get out there is I don't want to jump into something. Um, and this isn't so much the over planning. I'm definitely, uh, I'm definitely known for figuring out how to do good enough um, with many, many, uh, many, many things we approach. But I want to ensure that if, for instance, we were going to set up a, you know, a, a community budget inside of chapters uh, of chapters of OSD, I want to make sure I have the the funding or the commitment to funding at, at a minimum from enough organizations to where if we say every single chapter has a thousand dollars a month in discretionary spending for you know anything up to two hundred and fifty dollars that fits a pretty wide you know pretty wide berth. And, yeah. and the example I always use is it's, you know, it's, it's the veteran that's been, you know, in a tough situation, finally gets a job, you know, to go to the police academy, it can't afford boots for day one. Uh, that is like my favorite example to share because that, that's, you know, it's relevant to the veteran space, but there's a lot of similar situations, you know, in just society at large, or, you know, somebody that has, we worked with a gentleman uh, here in central Texas a number of years ago. And we always want to make sure like, you know, somebody might have a, a bill they can't pay, right? You know, a, a electric bill. Well, we might be able to help them. It might be possible to help them to pay that $175 this month. But what do we do to make sure they don't have that problem next month? Right. Because it can't be an in perpetuity. And yeah. so the responsibility is not just hand them a check and go take a picture and everybody, you know, look like gangsters in the picture. It's <laughs> no, okay, we're, we're willing to do this, but how do we solve the underlying problem? Yeah. And oftentimes it's just a basic conversation, finding skill sets. And the gentleman I'm referencing, he was, and again, I'm a little out of my element here, but he was had a bunch of certifications for welding that just needed to be updated. And for some reason, and I, I'm, I mean, I'm going to presume it was, it was pride, which many of us need to swallow it. He wasn't mentioning that very often. One of our guys kind of, you know, coped it out of him, if you will. And was like, whoa, dude, that's, you got that? We make a few phone calls to, you know, some of our, you know, some of our partners. And, and then we find an organization because it doesn't cost anything. It just takes time yeah. willing to essentially say, hey, we'll bring you up to speed. You need to come in here. And so within, I think it was like 45 to 60 days of us helping pay that $175 electric bill. He's, he now has a job paying him, I think it was 70 or $80 an hour. So his life changed yeah. forever. And part of it was swallowing pride, understanding we can't actually do anything alone. And we have to be open and transparent about things. Because in his case, you got to take care of your family. And you know, selfish pride doesn't just hurt yourself. It hurts everybody around you. Yeah. Boy, man, you said a lot there. This is actually fascinating because <laughs> we're going to talk more about charity stuff as the year ends. Because I really do. I have discovered this, that charity is such a powerful thing. And the reasons why we think we do it, what we think about charity are totally out of fucking whack. So first off, let me just say this. When you're able to give that charitable bump that gets that person that job that allows them to, to stabilize and thrive, guess what they do? They turn right back around and they start working on some kind of charitable aspect. And 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 this just in, and I'm positive, I, I can speak for Glenn on this. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. It is okay to go to a charity and say, I would like to help. I'm super passionate about this thing that you're doing. There's probably already a charity. Quit making 10,000 of the same machine and go yeah. help build out a machine that already exists for fuck's sake. No kidding. No kidding. No, we've, we've, we've been acquiring, if you will. I mean, I think at this point, it's probably about six organizations that we've absorbed, mainly because a lot of them were, and, and I actually say this lovingly, I know it's the phrase a lot of people pick on, but it's, it's the hobby charity, right? It's, uh, it's that single activity that somebody loves and wants to figure out how to take that to others. And then that turns into a, a charity for some reason in some cases. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying that's good or that's bad. But I will say that in a lot of cases, probably not having as a charity makes more sense initially. And you can still accomplish the exact same thing because it's just a bunch of people getting together to do an activity. Yeah. But if you connect that to something larger, then it becomes important. And again, it becomes, I should say, more important and more sustainable because you're able to take that time. You go out and see, think of super simplistic you know, examples here. You take the time where you go out and you go, you know, bowling with the boys. Well, what happens when you're not bowling anymore? Yeah. Like 
how, what does that group talk about when they've got challenges just being moms or dads or, you know, can't find jobs or want to find something better or newer or just need to consider finding people to mentor? And I always point out mentorship. Like, I don't, I don't think mentorship, I think it gets looked at too much through the context of just, you know, that's all about professional development. Right. Mentorship is communication and learning for, from people that are wiser than you yeah. and being able to acknowledge that. And so that's actually a lot of, I mean, from a, a culture and value standpoint, like we, we call it mentorship as a culture. Like mentorship can happen when we go and do a, uh, a hunting outing. And a lot of it is because we're trying to get to understand and know yeah. the individuals that are going so that when we're done with that, you know, that, that weekend going and, you know, hunting Texas white uh, whitetail deer, we can figure out where these people need to fit in. You know, maybe one of them needs to join us at next week's, you know, Google small business seminar. And another, we need to connect them with, you know, a volunteer opportunity with uh, Easter seals. And then it's getting to truly know people and, you know, create those, those real relationships oh, yeah. where you're physically proximate to each other. I mean, you know, you look online and it's how you and I initially connected. I think that's huge. Minimally, let's get on the phone and actually speak, you know, in real time with one another. But if you can, go out and grab coffee, you know, Boy. invite them out for dinner. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like, I mean, what, what, what the heck? I don't understand what's, what's happened where we end up, I think, making our lives inadvertently too complicated because we're trying to maintain yeah. thousands of shallow relationships as opposed to one by one developing you know, a smaller number of deeper relationship. Yeah. And that's a great transition because, you know, we're talking about really like it, these problems that we try to encounter, like what you're explaining, just the charity part, and it transitions quickly into mentoring and, and we're for sure going to stay on this track, but you just look at all the complexities we talked about and, and we didn't talk about all of the complexities. We didn't talk about all of the aspects you have to master in a business, in a charity, in life or whatever. But you, yeah, like you do need a mentor. And sometimes that mentor might be someone younger than you, less experienced, but they have a sp specific kind of wisdom. Like when I look at someone and I say, well, what's your, what's your go-to charity? Who are you leaning on to help them solve problems? And they don't know. It doesn't matter if they're 75 years old. I'm like, well, what the hell are you doing? Like, yes. let's pick one here. Come on with me and mine and let's go solve this problem because I have this wisdom of like, you don't realize, yeah, of course you're going to help someone, but the value you get back in terms of like what you get in a, in a, in a relationship or, you know, personally, all these things, why would you deny yourself that? Let's go work on some charitable things and put some value into your life in a way that you are absolutely lacking. And, and you will, mm -hmm. I promise, I promise you will go. Damn, I don't. Why did I wait so long to do that? It's such a wonderful thing, and and we're talking just about charity in this specific case. But there are so many things in life that are like that, where when someone else recognizes a shortfall, if you can work, if you have the capacity to work on that shortfall, which isn't always a given, you know, you will reap a huge benefit because that that wisdom, that recognition, you know, that push, you, you probably know it. You're like, you know what, I should be doing that. I just have never initiated the action. So let's initiate and see what happens. And then, like you said, everything should be welded and bonded with personal relationships. So I was out last night with Scott Husing and I. Uh, we, we did a show with a guy named Chad Prather at Watch Chad. Yep. Chad's hilarious. Chad, yeah. He's yeah. from Texas. You know Chad. And, oh, yeah, up north. <laughs> and, par yeah, and Party Foul Steve is his, his road dog when they go out on the road and do comedy shows. And just a chance to do that. Like, we've all been in the same room, but now, like, we've spent this time together and we're, you know, it's not fair to say that we're friends, but we're not not friends, you know? And yeah, yeah. so now, like, when there's opportunities, you know, I can think, oh, Chad would be great for this or Steve would be great for that. Or, or I should tell Scott about this to see who he's connected to. And you just, you develop this trusting relationship that, that enriches over time. So you don't want a thousand shallow ones, but you do want a thousand opportunities to create a pocket of depth where you can say, this is where I want to spend some time and, and enrich not only my life, but the lives of those people around me. And then the charities that they're working on, all of that stuff all goes together. And it's just not as simple as writing a fucking check, like get busy. And by the way, yep. this is just, this is just in, I say this a lot, Glenn, but charity isn't supposed to be easy. These are hard no. <laughs> problems to solve. Social problems are really fucking tough to solve. And they need a lot of people doing shit like, God, I really would rather do something else. That's probably good charity work you're doing right there. If you're like, this sucks, this is hard. 
Yeah. No, I, I mean, every day. And it, with a lot of what you said there, I mean, there's again, a, a bunch of super helpful nuggets. I mean, one of, one of the phrases I, I, I say a lot, you know, whether it's, you know, doing these type of conversations or out doing workshops or one-on-one mentorship is I can say for myself, you know, I'm a byproduct of other people taking risks on me up yep. to this particular point in time. And the reason I lead with that is when we look at mentorship and we look for, again, this is either, it could be, again, in the case I deal with a lot, it's, you know, veteran transitioning out, but it's actually no different, you know, with a high schooler that's not going to college looking for a job or somebody went to college getting out of this is again, it's just humanity and connecting. You need to figure out how to create relationships, understand other people, and then become the solution to a problem <laughs> where sometimes they don't realize they even have because for me even leading into this like my background is really bizarre if you look at it on on paper i mean it looks like not it's not even one of those where it looks like i've jumped around to a lot of things it's more like whoa how did you what like what? over here you've got smart <laughs> weapon systems and over here you did a nonprofit years ago with this thing and you've Worked with, I built products where, you know, Bob Iger with Disney was a stakeholder and I've trained kids that have gotten drafted, you know, in the NBA lottery uh, in basketball. So that's not because I'm some genius or I was, you know, employee for at Facebook or I'm a world-class athlete. It's people, process, and problem solving. I understand those more than average. That's it. And I also, and as you and I were talking, you know, beforehand offline, you know, I've got to nobody's surprise, legitimate ADD, not the ha ha, I have ADD, I can't pay attention. You know, it's, it's something that a number of people have. Um, it's something that I, the more and more I even read and understand it, it's actually the undiagnosed ADD is probably the truest, largest mental health problem in the United States. And lastly, because if you look at the type of people that end up having ADD, as much as you can have a lot of business success, you're also more likely to get a divorce, abusing drugs and alcohol, be in prison, commit crimes. And not because you're, you're on the slippery slope one way or another. It's just where you get the type of feedback that your brain is seeking. Yes. And it's oversimplified by calling it ADD. But when you understand whether you've got that or not, or you wake up and you're trying to figure things out, it's understanding motivations and realizing your life requires other people, A, and then B, for me, and I'll say this matter of factly so, I believe our purpose on earth is to serve others, yeah. period. And when you can make that adjustment, and mind you, again, it's probably the same as you, I didn't understand that completely when I was younger. I mean, yes, I volunteered, I'd give back. But you'd always hedge against it mm. if it was like, well, I got to look out for myself first. And it's not even necessarily a, a, a purely selfish driven mentality. It's that leap of faith. The leap of faith is probably the most truly selfish thing you can do is help other people because then they want to invest their attention and their time, their talent, their treasure back in you. You want to do that, and then everybody gets excited, and you know the engine just purrs. So that again, a lot of these things are difficult, and I think again we've kind of bounced back and forth on a number of different mental health topics. When you're at your lowest low, it's hard to realize that you don't want to need other people, even though you know you need them in the same thought process. So the more you can be around others and develop, you know these these relationships when things are it doesn't have to be great all the time, but let's just say you're content and you really get to know people, that's who's there to also assist when you get into those tough times. Not because, hey, man, can we sit down and talk about this thing I'm thinking? It's that perceptive nature of people that care about us where they're able to just understand, you know what, Something, something's wrong. And sometimes we need to talk about it. Other times it's, hey, why don't we go take a, a walk, go, you know, go down the trail and, and just chat. We don't need, you know, just talk about whatever, just be there, just, just hang out. Let me help you, you know, unwind a bit. And that takes effort. Like you said, none of this is easy. It takes effort. You got to put the phone down. You got to pay attention. You have to prioritize, but it's worth it at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, everybody, we're talking to Glenn Banton. You can find him on LinkedIn for sure. If you're typing Glenn Banton, there's only one. LinkedIn will try to trick you 
and they will retype <laughs> his last name. Don't listen to them. Just type in B L A N T O N, and you will find Glenn. And you can so you, say, you you did it. B B A N T O N. Oh, see, look at that. I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> I and LinkedIn both don't know how to do yeah. <laughs> Banton. Glenn Banton. Yep. LinkedIn, and I, you can also look up OSD Operation Supply Drop. But OSD will get you there. Uh, he does a lot of different things, and that's why we're talking to him. It's just because he's you're like this hub of knowledge. Whether you're helping out veterans or doing other things, you know, helping out NBA draftees, you know, it's just such a wide thing. Smart weapons for military. <laughs> what in the heck? How did you get all these things together? Did you recognize pretty early on that you were just uh, uh, was this a design? Like, I want to become a hub. I want to know fifteen hundred different things about fifteen hundred different things. Or what was it that turned you into this uh, this unique collection of skills and knowledge that you are? Yeah, I think part of it, and again, uh, a lot of this has been. I sort of understood part. I sort of understood pieces of it, and it was really almost maybe a year ago that I truly understood some of like my behaviors and positionings as I've gone through this whole entire journey. And, and part of it was, again, with how my brain works. And again, coming back to the ADD, and a lot of people will understand this. That last bit of complete follow through is extremely difficult. That is, it's difficult for everybody. But the challenge you end up doing is my mind in an effort to diversify, this is a really weird thing, like in an effort to diversify my attention ends up just allowing more and more and more and more and more things to be inside that of attention. And I will get all of them done. Again, not because I'm any better than anybody else. It is just purely because I can't help it or, you know, accumulating these different pieces of knowledge. I picked up really, really early on in my life where you walk into most rooms and it takes almost no effort to be the smartest person in the room. And even a smart room that you can be that case. Or you can find these, these abilities to have you know, relevant conversation and relevant information. And, and I, I truly believe a lot of this starts to kind of trickle back into one of the negative byproducts of being so connected. You know, it's like, you, know, you don't need to know anything. Google can know it for me. Well, you're not an interesting person if you need to go to Google to figure out what to talk <laughs> about in a conversation. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have, yeah, I, by nature, I'm actually massively introverted, which surprised, that's another surprise to most people. And, and I said, no, think about it. I said, I'll talk, I'll talk forever. But you had to prompt me. If you never came up and prompted me, you will never hear anything out of my, out of my mouth in most cases. Just because my, like, my natural state is I'd, I'd rather just be in the corner of mine and my own business. You know, maybe chatting with one person. Right. Definitely not the middle of the room life of the party. But then the other piece of it too was as just jobs and opportunities and things change, I would get bored really, really fast. I don't buy into a lot of the manufactured culture internally because oftentimes, you know, and, I, and I've been a part of this in executive teams, you know, you create this culture that you want the company to be, but fail to realize that it still gets filtered by the people and the more and more new people you have, the culture just adapts and changes over time. And then oftentimes you end up with two cultures. One is the one you project outwardly with, and then there's an internal one. And that used to just grate on me. And this is actually weirdly enough, because a lot of people ask, well, how'd you get involved with veterans? Because I'm a, I'm a civilian myself. And a lot of it was because I would find that the other peers that I would work with or you know, people that would work on my teams that had the same frustrations were veterans. They just wanted to go to work, do something awesome, go home, and then come back the next day and do it. I'm like, man, that, that's me. Let's do it. Let's, let's team up. Let's make this stuff happen. Um, so originally, you know, I'm just... I'm just trying to figure out what can I do to keep myself busy, take care of my wife and my kids every single day. And th that came down to just understanding people, figuring out how to develop processes. And then there's always problems to solve. And if you can help solve problems, big and small, suddenly you are very useful to a lot of different people. You said an important thing I wanted to get into because this is an area of expertise. I don't often get to flex this, this muscle, but it's pretty fucking big. Culture defies design hey this is pa turner from lions rock productions we create podcasts around here and if you your brand or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast just talk to me i'll give you the advice on the right gear the best plan is show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you that's sustainable that's scalable and fun hit me up at pete at breakdownshow.com let me help i want to hear about it culture defies design it doesn't give mm -hmm. a fuck what you think you're going to create 
it is what it is that you can shape it. You can channel it. You can use it to your advantage. But those are like, when I talked to, uh, when I get hired to consult on consult on, on, uh, on culture, these are the things mm-hmm. I try to give to CEOs. It's like quit trying to redefine someone. Anybody who wants to deal in culture has to understand the infrastructure of the mind of the person or thing that they're going to interact with. And culture is not, well, I'm a Mexican and I'm yeah. Irish. First off, you're not Irish. You're from America. You've never been to Ireland. So, you know, <laughs> like, like that specific part of, of the culture is like, you're actually not Irish, but you think you are. So that's part of your reality. How do I work within that to create the outcome that I want as a CEO? Because if you say, hey, our culture is hard work, getting after problems, and then celebrating, you know, when, when we have a win and I go out and I can't find that amongst your people. You've got a mm-hmm. culture problem and you can, you can nudge culture, but you have to measure it. You have to listen for it. You have to accept that what you know about someone else's culture and reality is not going to be as accurate as you think. And it's based more, culture is based more on a series of mistakes and misunderstandings that you get better at, at accepting and sorting through because really culture, if you're going to shape and work within it, it here's the ultimate goal. I want to use I want to use Glenn's culture to my advantage so that we both accomplish our goal together. And if Glenn Mm -hmm. has a path that will get him there, and this is my leadership philosophy when I'm actually in charge of something, there's a hundred ways to skin a cat. There's a hundred ways to skin a cat wrong. They're all the same way. So if your way seems like it might work and you're pretty confident about it, how do I help you with your way? Because I don't want you to have to fucking do it my way. That's goofy. No, I'm a hundred percent with you. That's actually the part of the culture or the, the lack thereof in some of these organizations where I, I just could not relate to it where you'd look at processes. And I look at outcomes, right? It's about okay. outcomes. What are you trying to accomplish? And if somebody can do something in the perceived same amount of effort, same amount of time or less than what you think the process is, let them do that. Let them be Learn from that. <laughs> you might learn a little, a little piece of it that makes you better. I mean, every night uh, my son and I, and he's, you know, he's in sixth grade, We've got one of those little maze balls, the 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 things where they're like three dimensional yeah. into the ball, and it's a maze that goes around. Perplexes, I think they're called. And we both have the same one, and every single night we compete with each other on those. And what was funny is early on, I would beat him all the time because I was fast, but it was more the slow is smooth, smooth is fast mentality. Uh-huh. Whereas he would be a little bit more aggressive. He'd fall off, and then he'd try to play catch up and lose it. Now he beats me almost all the time. And last night I actually took, I, I said, Hey buddy, let me sit. I want to sit next to you. I want to take two. Cause I think there's like, I don't know, 70 different moves you have to do. Right. Uh-huh. I, I want to sit next to him. I said, do three at a time with me. I want to see where your hands go. And I started watching him do this thing. It's the same thing with like learning to do a Rubik's cube. It's all about those movements. Yeah. And to me, those are the most simplistic forms of understanding process where I might be able at the end of the day to accomplish the same thing, but if we need, you know, the the right combination of speed and accuracy, you've got to learn from people that are yeah. faster than you or more accurate from you. Otherwise, you're not get, you're not going to get any better at what you do. Uh, and then to the <laughs> other point about culture just being, it's not something you can bake and engineer. In you know, one of the companies I work with, there's a lot of you know incredible, really smart people, and many of them are still friends and business partners, but. Our culture was defined by our initial tagline, which was, we're smarter than you, which, yes, that is a very bold statement. And I would say for probably the first year and a half, that was a very true statement. And we're smarter than you. It was, you need to work with us because we're smarter than you. Well, what happens when you grow from 25 to 50 to 150 to 250 employees? I guarantee you. Not only can you not find enough people to be able to continue to say we're smarter than you, <laughs> yeah. you have to hire people that can't say that because of scale. They need, you need less expensive people that are being mentored yep. by managers and whatnot. So again, yep. it's tricky and you see this all the time, but so many people just push back against the reality of human psychology and sociology. Yeah. And again, on the cultural thing, you know, the design culture if you think about it like we want to get a reference of it because if i was to ask you how you define culture i promise it's going to be different than how i do it and that only continues as you put more people in the room 
So just to simplify it, I always use this basic one. This is not my definition. This is an academic definition because academics are good at describing things. Anything not divine or designed by DNA is culture. That's just it. Like yep. it's just, mm-hmm. that's just how we, how it is, how we lay down our asphalt on our roads is part of our culture. And if you don't believe me, go to any other country and everybody does it differently. They may not even put asphalt down. So th- that's one of the things is to understand that like culture is huge. And then if that's not easy enough, just culture is like gravity. When you yep. design gravity, how does that work? <laughs> like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it just does. Yeah. And so, yeah, gravity just does. Culture just does. So like in the morning when you're in a hurry, gravity's like, hey, by the way, your keys just fell on the ground and that coffee just spilled on your shirt. And so if you don't have to account for gravity on a day-to-day basis, but it's getting its share of your business. You know, it's Mm -hmm. doing what, and so culture is the same way as if you don't account for it, God bless, you're going to outwork your problem and and that's going to be one of them. But why would you work so hard? Why wouldn't you put that effort into something else? So you manage your understanding of the culture around you and you have a chance at learning how to use it to your advantage. And it's almost always the case that someone else's path that accomplishes your goal is better than your path because now they can go accomplish that goal. And you can go do something else. It like increases production exponentially when you're able to work with it. Is it comfortable at first? No, nothing that's hard is, but you can get to the point where you're like, this is, this is just, and it's, it's not cultural clash. Culture has intersections. And when nobody's Mm -hmm. paying attention to the signals, yes, you smash into each other. You know, when you come up to a new intersection, you're not sure how to work it. You have to slow down and accept that there's going to be some discomfort here. And I I always use the word, I use the word miscomfort because it's not that it's discomfort. It's discomfort you don't know. And as soon as you get used to that, like you go to Cuba, it looks different than, you know, St. Louis. And so it's uncomfortable, but it's really not. There's a lot of people that live there and they're like, yeah, this is our life. This is how we do things. And as you spend Mm -hmm. time in that culture, and I'm using countries to make this a simple thing, but this can be one company to another. It can be engineering to sales department. It can be marketing, talking to operations you know all of these are different cultures in terms of business the more time you spend in that space and allow for them to be normal you will get to their normal faster than if you fight it and ignore all the signals and and, and uh, intersections absolutely well and that's the thing i mean kind of back to yes and asking the question i was talking about you know with a lot of my background and jump you know seemingly jumping around these different things i mean that that intersection that i love is between operations, sales, and mar- you know, marketing and product. Because again, the this is cliche, and I'm saying it's kind of at scale, but the cultures that exist in those, if you, if you know, lined up a bunch of people and said, hey, you know, what's the culture of an engineering team look like? And, and you get a lot of people say, ah, you know, they roll in around 10, and then they work late through the night, probably drink too much energy drink. And you know, I, I jokingly said with some of the engineers I've worked with, and I say this lovingly too, they would level of effort themselves themselves out of a job if they had the choice. Because <laughs> in their opinion, you know, every time we'd look at quoting a job, it was like so difficult and it takes so much time that we could never actually work with a client. But at the same time, again, cliche, you look at the sales team, they don't care about that stuff. Right. They don't care about everybody else. All they want is, is money and they'll sell whatever the client wants to hear. And all of these are extremes. But when you sit in between all of those mm-hmm. different things, they're all just motivated, right? Yeah. Sales is motivated with some of that cliche because what are they measured on? Revenue, money. You know, Engineers are motivated that way because they're measured on you know, man hours, or they're measured on, you know, lines of code, if you work with you know, some sort of insane company that goes that direction. And, you know, marketing sees it one way and operation sees it another. And the more you can understand even those subcultures, you don't have to adopt it, but it makes life a lot easier. And that even jumps into just a lot of the, you know, fun stuff in the broader culture, you know, today, you, know, you look at, again, the, the wailing and gnashing of teeth on a daily basis between all these opposing viewpoints. Yeah. And it's not to say you can't have opposing viewpoints, but just for a second, step into the middle of both of them, uh-huh. keep your viewpoint, you know, let them have theirs and then determine if there's a conversation or an exchange to be had. Sometimes it is, sometimes there isn't, but it gives you a lot more awareness of what's going on and picking and choosing what to focus your effort and your attention and your, you know, <laughs> your, your being on. Uh, Cause there's, I mean, there's a limited amount of time, obviously 
for our entire life, but every single day has a limited amount of time and every yeah. minute has a limited amount of things that we can actually put our attention to. So you got to pick, pick <laughs> wisely. My goodness. I love it, man. I love it. Yeah. That's such a great point. And, and you know, maybe instantly think of the political situation right now. Like it, it, there's just, look, these problems are hard to solve. There is simply no room for partisanship. It, it makes it so that the problem is not solvable because look, whatever, however many, again, there's a hundred ways to skin the cat, right? If your way is so, you know, driven by partisanship, even if it's the right way, it's just that it's not possible. It is not an avenue that can succeed. So you need a thousand, a thousand ways to solve this problem. Where do you Venn diagram those and then get in the middle of those Venn things? That means you don't get what you want and, and you don't get the best solution. But you get a solution mm -hmm. that's possible. Like right now, we you know, remember when immigration was going to be a problem? We were going to deal with it. We had kids in cages. Nobody yep. fucking cares today about that because we were too partisan about it. And we've had to move on to something else, you know? So these oh, yeah. problems that are super hard to solve, they have ways to get through them and solve them. But everybody has to be like, this fucking sucks. This is the worst solution. But it is the solution that you can get to, you know, medical care, same thing. If everybody sacrificed everything that they had to get the best plan, we could do it, but there's nobody in that line. It's like, Hey, I'm completely willing to give up all of my, all of my stuff, whether you're an insurance company making a billion dollars or you're a, a patient with a life-threatening illness. And you're like, I, you know, I trust that if I give up all of my comfort in this, we'll get a better answer. Nobody's in that line. It just doesn't exist. Oh, yeah. Well, and even again, a lot of it's funny because a lot of these topics are talking about all, you know, all mold into each other. And it's funny because I've had that same conversation, you know, about the healthcare side of things. And you run into this this challenge where it's like, even if you did come up with a plan for the best, well, then I have to actually care about, well, wait a second. Are you smoking? Are you eating all these things? <laughs> yeah. Like, like, and again, and then, and that's where a lot of stuff comes back to this cultural perception of what is, you know, what is freedom? What, it, what, what does that mean to you? What does that mean to you based upon, you know, your, your faith, your lack thereof, your, you know, where you maybe, you know, maybe you're a first uh, generation American and you have, you know, you did truly come from Ireland, you know, here's your example. So you are Irish. It's being able to factor in all of those different pieces. But the only way to even have a conversation about it is everybody has to step into the middle. And we still may not do anything. Yeah. I mean, I've learned, I think the hard way, I think, I think the hardest thing in leadership is realizing when to choose not to do something. You know, that, those a lot of times are the, the, the most difficult ones. But again, it's just it, it to me just comes down to understanding and and building those smaller, closer relationships or, you know, as I've even said with a lot of the political things and, it, and and really try to temper a lot of my friends around me is, hey, guys, because I'm, I'm just as invested in this. And from a personal perspective, even yeah. though a lot of the business stuff is yeah. apolitical personal perspective, I'm incredibly invested, very active. But if you can't genuinely help your neighbor. Who freaking cares what's happening anywhere else in the world? And I don't say that because <laughs> yeah. it's any less important, but I'm just, again, simple, simple, like scale problem. Yeah. If everybody help, could help their neighbor, then the problems at the furthest reaches from your neighborhood would be closer to being solved. And, and that's a very easy thing to, I think, to understand, but it's the same challenge. Again, all these things roll back. It's the same challenge where in the veteran space, in comparison to some of the other, you know, nonprofit initiatives that exist, we have a, a more challenging, again, scale of a message because it does take acknowledging some deeper challenges with adults, right? as opposed to you know, when you donate to sick kids and I've got kids and they've, they've benefited from, you know, some of these fantastic programs with great children's hospitals. So please don't stop because that's not the point, but all things considered, if somebody's passively participating with, you know, donating or supporting nonprofit, mm. you know, endeavors, they're going to pick the one that actually requires the least amount of emotional effort. You know, you look at some of the challenges with, you know, bringing water to Africa or fruit to Africa, and then find out many of them, you know, end up supporting warlords, not because that's the intent of the nonprofit or uh -huh. even doing anything unethical, but what's the outcome we're actually trying to adjust and why do so many people support? Well, it's easier to support something that's 
at, you know, way at arm's length away from you because you don't have to emotionally invest in it. And that, again, it comes down to if that's your jam, get emotionally invested in it. But whatever it is, please at least make an attempt to support your own neighbors first and foremost, not because of anything more than you should know the people around you because you can band together, learn their strengths and weaknesses, and who knows, find another initiative or opportunity to go help and impact other people. I'm trying to understand. One of the things I care a lot about is the, is the planet. And uh, I wouldn't say I'm an environmentalist, but I wouldn't not say that either. I guess I'm sort of trying to sort out what I am. And, and I've got a friend who's uh, very passionate about climate change and, and what we can do about it. And this is not, this is for everybody listening, this is not a political conversation. This is just me trying to understand this greater problem because I, I don't feel like I've got my arms wrapped around it. It's, it's easy to wave your arms and go, it's the planet. It's going to burn up. Okay, that's great. But like, what's the actual, you know, what are we actually trying to do here? Right. And so one of the things I struggle with, and I've just not heard the clear answer. So I'm hoping, you know, that you might, I <laughs> might have an answer to climate change for me. It sounds to me like the war on drugs. We're going to reverse climate change. Well, what the fuck does that even mean? Like, what's the outcome? What are we trying to accomplish here? And if you're telling me, you know, it's a carbon based problem, then, you know, there's a lot of data that says methane's a bigger problem. So are we talking about a methane problem? Are we talking about a carbon problem? Uh, what is the, you know, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere has never been static. It's always changed. The sun is a big influencer. So how do I deal? How do I reckon with, you know, my desire to take care of, you know, our planet? Because I think it is important. And I'm not against petrochemicals. I'm also recognize that scratching down mountains to take minerals out of them is another way of like we call that renewable. Let's be honest, though, we're just taking yeah. a different resource and and using it. So how yeah. do we how do I sort through this, man? What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's funny because I, I go through the same thing. And I'll start by saying I'll, I'll mention I went to the Elks Foundation uh, annual dinner years and years and years ago. And again, this is basically a high-end hunting convention, firearms, all conservatives. And mind you, again, I'll just, I, I think it's worth saying, again, not because they're political. I, I'm a very traditional conservative viewpoint on a lot of things. Okay. And a lot of it's because I'm, I'm a historian. I love history. I love understanding the good and bad of things. And, you know, my, my point of view with, you know, America is America itself is not the land. And arguably, it's not really even the people. That's kind of the secondary part. It's this, it's this ideal yeah. to strive, you know, to strive for. So that that's where a lot of my, you know, my background comes with. And then I am, I'm a, I, you know, for me, I'm a man, you know, I'm a man of faith. I'm a believer. And so that factors in massively. Right. But so with this example of the Elks Foundation, I thought it was really interesting because those people in that room are some of the biggest environmentalists and conservation advocates on planet Earth. And you would never think that based upon the types of narratives. Well, it's obvious. It's the same thing. You look back at it again, this magical thing that I believe a lot of people that are missing. It's called history and understanding people that have been here before us. Teddy Roosevelt, uh -huh. again, probably one of the superstar presidents. What was a lot of what he worked on? It was conservation. It was environmentalism. But he's a darling of conservative and libertarian. Yeah. And so it's, it's a perspective. It's a point of view. I think a lot of the challenge, even what you're, you're battling is the fact that number one, I don't believe there is an answer, like one answer. Right. I think it kind of comes down to a combination of some legislative stuff, some realization that yes, you know, as this, you know, hurtling rock in space, there are some things we can control. There's other things we can't. And then, like you said, it's figuring out what do we focus on? And you know, one of the things that I, I I'd come across recently, and for for what I could actually research, it seemed for the most you know it seemed for the most part pretty straightforward. But when you look at like vehicle emissions, that's something everybody wants to focus on. Mm -hmm. But you've got two odd things that I came across. You know, one is like, like the twelve largest container ships. This is hundred percent true, yeah. by the way. What em you're about yeah. to say this yeah. is vital. It, it emits more yes. carbon than like all of the vehicles on planet earth by this massive factor. Right. And that doesn't get looked at. And then number two yeah. is kind of what you said, you know, with renewable energy and scraping the side of mountains, things like Tesla and electric cars, right? Again, buy one, whatever, buy it because it's cool because you like it or you like the economics behind it. But where does the energy that you're filling this car up come from? So let's not <laughs> pretend that because there's not, 
exhaust coming out of your vehicle right now that there's not clean coal, unclean coal, whatever. I don't really care. Let's not pretend that that yeah. energy had to come from somewhere else. But that takes intellectual honesty and responsibility to then pick and choose what you actually care about. But all that said, it comes down to the thing I was saying before. The number one place you have to start is on your property and in your neighborhood. You know, you look at things like, you know, even being able to grow some of your own vegetables. Like, again, what's the supply chain behind vegetables? Get, get them wherever you want. I buy a lot of mine at HEB because we live here in Texas. I don't think that's a bad thing. But I'll admit, part of it's when we're in Texas, we think everything from Texas is better than everywhere else. So I will buy something from Texas because it's from Texas. Right. But it also means it's closer. So the supply chain did not impact the environment the same way it might have if it was flown from halfway around the world. Right. But if you want that piece of fruit that only grows in Indonesia, well, I think it's awesome that in 2019 that we have the ability to get that fruit and it's fresh and it somehow can get to me here in Texas. So again, I don't think there's any answer and I don't even know if that's particularly insightful for you or anybody that hears it, but I think it comes down to understanding that has more to do with perspective or the why you care about it because if you look at the motivations in relation to what people want i think what they're arguing of i think what the big argument about is the why we need to focus on something like that and there's many problems that have these same examples and you have varying perspectives of where to start as opposed to i think everybody can kind of agree like nobody wants to burn the planet up or, you know, make it disappear. But again, there's some, you know, there's some different perspectives that think we as man are completely control of something versus, you know, those that, you know, those that don't. And so those are hard to reconcile in some cases, and it requires people to come, you know, to come to the middle. And I don't even think it's about actually compromising on a solution in some cases is you truly need to understand the motivations and figure out if that's something you can, you know, get over and can get around. And if you can't, I still are, I still don't know what's the, like why we need to go run around yelling and screaming at each other because we should just move on to the next problem for a moment because there's thousands of problems to solve. Yeah, and I'm sure there's more that we could actually make some leeway on if we prioritize a bit better. You know that thing about ships. I love that stat because it, it goes to show what you think you understand about a problem. There's bigger, there's bigger angles. And, and so where's the money spent? Is it spent in trying to solve, uh, you know, fuel emissions? Is it in trying to figure out how to make a tri bread ship that is, you know, cause it's all about the torque to get that ship moving. Yep. Cause all of that consumption is not when it's underway. It's all in getting that weight moving. So, so how do we do that? Do we put a bunch of electric tugboats next to it? And then, yeah. okay. Like you said, you know, thermodynamics they have rules and uh, you don't just get to break them you know there's that energy has to come from somewhere so how much carbon comes out from getting those ships going from some other means because it does still take carbon at some point yeah. and you know these problems get to be really challenging and then i saw this incredible thing the other day and i'm dying to get this guy on the show but he's a phd and he studies the climate and he's like by the way we're figuring out that all of our water reservoirs are creating a lot more methane than we ever accounted for. And this is our water so we can survive as a species in a given area, you know? Yeah. And so then I, I see things like we're going to make algae ladders, you know, and have more algae and it'll trap carbon. Oh, and by the way, the outgas from that is more methane. So you, like you have these things like the system is so complex to manage. This is why I, I'm always like, yeah, but what's the outcome? Like you can reverse climate change. Well, I, I want the climate to change. It does change. Let's not call it that. Let's figure out. I don't think we've defined the problem. Oh yeah. Well, and it comes down to it. it, it you know, it's 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 all it's attention, and it's not even so much like uh, you know uh, the the mass media is terrible or social media right. or all this. It it's still attention. It's how are you able to get the attention of somebody to pay attention to what you're talking about? Oftentimes, if driven by ad dollars and that drives the narrative or lack thereof. And, you know, it, it's, again, it's just a really challenging situation and having kids. I mean, that's, that is one of the biggest challenges is figuring out how to help them navigate through some of this stuff. Like how, how do you deal with this when you've got sixth graders yelling and screaming, you know, whatever they're hearing repeating at home one way or another, and how do you choose to engage or not engage? Like that's a, 
that is a very big challenge. Whereas, you know, I was, I'm still of the sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, uh, you know, era. And I think that's a much, you know, I hate to say friendlier way because it's not about being friendly. Sometimes we need to stand up for what our beliefs are, but you need to have substance behind it. And as you're relating, you know, to it, it's, you know, it's almost an OODA loop challenge that's uh-huh. constant, you know, observe, orient, decide, act. And you can't prescribe or legislate in a way that's static and linear because by the time you make that decision, you already need to make another one. I mean, let's not forget. And I think it's kind of the running joke. And yes, climate does change, but what the seventies, everybody was saying the world's going to freeze and we're going to yes. have an ice age. Like, yeah, yeah. like, and, and I'm not saying like back then, based upon what they tracked, that's what it seemed like. And now everybody, it's like, how about we just agree that it doesn't actually matter at that level, at that type of narrative. It's what do you do about the fact things are changing? Well, let's look at efficient. I mean, it's efficiency. That's, yeah. It's all about efficiency and outcomes. And that's going to constantly change based upon technological advancement. And, and that's what we have. I mean, that's the fun part about being here on the search. That's true. Hey, man, listen, I appreciate it. I've had you for an hour. I want to respect your time. I want to do more of this with you. But for right now, thanks for coming on the show. And, and man, I, I just appreciate the hell out of how hard you work at helping people. And if we had 10% more of you out there, we would have a lot less uh, problem and struggling because there'd be a lot of folks helping each other out. So uh, my call to everybody is, again, get out there and contribute in some way. If you don't have a personal charity and you're an adult, get the fuck to work. Go out and find one that you can not only donate to, but put your time into. And uh, well, those things tend to be better if you act locally. But again, Glenn, thanks for coming on. Check out Glenn on LinkedIn, Glenn Banton, just B-A-N-T-O-N uh, or OSD, Operation Supply Drop. And you can find out more about him. He does a lot. We'll have him on more. Thanks to Jason Piccolo for setting this up. And uh, I will talk to you later, brother. Hey, I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure.